Hello there, pen fans. Brian Goulet here of GouletPens.com, and it's episode number 261 of Goulet Q&A. Uh, today I'm going to be talking about Napkin Notes Dad, hence my shirt, uh, historical reference of some limited edition pens and some other good stuff. So I hope you can join me here today. I have a lot of different pens to show, actually. Just a couple of the questions that I'm taking today uh, warranted me wanting to pull out a lot of pens. So we'll see how that goes. Um, some of the things that I've been up to in the last week, the reason I'm wearing this shirt is because we had Garth Callahan come and visit us in our office. Um, it was an extreme honor to have him. He is known as the Napkin Notes Dad. Uh, he's been on a number of TV shows. They're actually writing a movie about his story. Um, basically, he has had cancer seven times, and he lives like 10 minutes from our office, too. Uh, and he, um, through his various diagnoses, has uh, been writing notes to his daughter on a napkin. Just little sentences here and there, little inspirational things, words of wisdom, fatherly advice. Um, and when he uh, got one of his most negative prognoses of cancer diagnoses, I think it was number three or four, um, he decided to write notes all the way through when his daughter was going to graduate high school. Well, he's beat all the odds and he's still here with us um, kicking around doing his thing, uh, promoting his causes. But uh, yeah, it's a very interesting story. And uh, his daughter's now graduated high school. So really, really cool story. Um, and just crazy that he's like in our backyard here. So we connected with him recently. He's um, since, you know, really gotten and reunited his passion for fountain pens too through doing this writing over the years and then just connecting with our company and stuff like that. So he came and spoke to our company here and it was uh, really inspiring um, to hear him with his words of advice from somebody who lives each day very, very intentionally. So that was pretty cool. Um, we'll do some more stuff with him. We're going to have a video that we're going to publish of his talk and then I'll probably be on his podcast and we may do something together in the future. I don't know. It's kind of kind of cool to connect with somebody like that. So that was pretty interesting. Don't get to do that every week. Um, I'm also going to be going to, <laughs> this is a very completely swinging the pendulum the other way, but I'm going to be going to a rock concert this week uh, to go see Iron Maiden, which should be an experience for me for sure. I don't go to a whole lot of concerts, um, let alone heavy metal concerts, but any of you who are Iron Maiden fans out there, um, I had a friend who was able to get me tickets, and uh, Drew and I are going to be going and checking that out. So I'll have already gone by the time this publishes, um, but I expect that to be quite memorable. <laughs> um, some other cool things that we're doing on the pen front, um, Rachel really has helped to draft a lot of these because she's got a fantastic memory uh, to draft some historical blog posts for us on various uh, pen limited edition, special edition things. Because, you know, what happens, and we get asked about this from time to time from you all, um, a pen comes, it sells out, it's no longer on the site, and unless we have maybe promoted it or blogged about it or something, there's no real reference of what that thing was after it's no longer sold. And this has been the case all along for all various pens of special editions and things. Um, but we thought, hey, you know, we could at least use the blog maybe as a platform. We had a lot of debate internally about how we should go about uh, kind of addressing all these things because we we want there to be a record of these these pens but we can't just leave them up on the site for a number of internal reasons you know it, it clogs up our reporting and and it just kind of creates an ever growing backlog of products that are no longer sellable um, also it messes up with search rankings and um, makes things confusing on the site we have a bunch of products that are no longer sold so we opted not to leave them up on the site as sellable products but um, you know, the blog is a really great place to kind of have a historical record of such things. So we are doing a roundups of various um, focused pen, limited edition, special edition things. Um, we started out with, um, you know, some Lamy stuff. So we're going to have Safari, All Star, these types of things. Um, Twisby, we're going to have, um, you know, the Eco and the 580 and stuff like that. We're going to do Vanishing Point, Duragraph, you know, so basically all the pens that like seem to come out with pretty regular. Um, special editions or limited editions, we're going to round them up in one blog post and at least you'll be able to see at a glance what year was which pen and what colors have they done before and all that. We'll have, you know, kind of pictures of everything there. Now the challenge is we don't necessarily, you know, some of these that go way far back, like the Vanishing Point, for example, they were doing, you know, special versions of that long before we came along. So we don't have pictures. We may not even have a version of that pen. So 
We're only going back as far as we've existed. We're debating about whether we should try to go back further. Some of those it's easier to do than others, like Lamy, I've got collections that go back pretty far, um, but we may be missing some. So we're trying to debate, like, should it be completely comprehensive? But anyway, we're going to publish what we're going to publish first, get your feedback on it and see how you think of it. Um, Twisby has come out with a new pen this week, the Eco T Coral. Drew and I did it right now on this on Wednesday. So if you want more details about it, you can see it there. But I consider it to be more of a true coral, kind of walking that line between pink and orange. Um, maybe it leans a little to the orange side, but it really just coral is one of those colors that you just, it can vary so much. But anyway, we have them this week. They're probably going to sell out just like every Twisby special edition does. We'll probably get restocked. I never know how many we're going to get or when. So it's just kind of like up in the air. But if you are interested in coral, know that they're out and around right now um, and we'll probably be able to get more. Uh, and then also, and right now on Wednesday, on Monday, Drew and I talked about the uh, Vanish, uh, sorry, the Visconti nibs changeover from 23 karat palladium to 18 karat gold. So that is in process. If you haven't heard yet, they are in the process of changing their nibs over to 18 karat gold. Um, and I have a question about that and I'll get into more details about that and you can watch right now too if you want more but just know that that is coming and i'll show you the differences between those two when i answer that question um, we have some sale items we have uh, the natuno 1911 on sale it ended up blowing out um, but we are restocking more i think what's happening is um, natuno is going to be coming out with some newer pens and they wanted to kind of move through some of the stock that they already had. So they, as a manufacturer, have incentivized all the retailers to um, drop the price on those and get them into more people's hands, help fuel the brand a little bit. Um, so that's kind of cool. So that's that's where that's coming from. Uh, and so you, if you're interested in the 1911, know that we're gonna have uh, more of those coming soon. Uh, and then also we have the Conklin Empires, severe price drop on those as well. Looking to move those along too, so you can get a good deal on those. Uh, we've got three new Robert Oster inks that have come out this week. Morning Shine, Velvet Storm, and Aussie Liquid Gold. So if you're a Robert Oster fan like I am, uh, you can check out those new colors. They're coming out with new colors all the time. Uh, so we have those that we launched this week. Some Aurora Duo Carts that are just around the corner. They have been redesigned. If you remember the Duo Cart from, gosh, year, year and a half ago, something like that. Um, they've been redesigned, but similar idea, hooded nib, very vintage inspired. Um, some new colors, and I'm, I'm, I'm digging these much more, um, and they write really nicely. And then uh, Platinum has a new limited edition, the Roca. It's going to be coming out, too. We're waiting on that kind of any day. I think it's going to be next week on that one, though. And then we got some other various things that are coming, but they all have question marks by them in terms of when they're coming, so um, I'll speak on them more once I have more information, but that's what's up this week so far. All right, let's get to the questions, shall we? Pen and writing questions, starting out with squeaking squid on Instagram. I just got myself a Lamy Studio, and now I'm curious how many special edition colors exist for it. Um, so I was, I interpreted your question to be somewhat historical. So I did some research and I looked through my own collection. I actually have most of the past Studio Special Editions. They've, um, you know, they were consistent. They started in 2007, I think it was. They started coming out with some. It was more or less every year. They took a huge break for a few years there, and now they're like doubling up and stuff. It's, it's, so it hasn't been like super consistent every single year like Pilot Vanishing Point has been in recent years of, you know, every year it's one limited edition kind of thing. These are special editions. They kind of come out as Lamy has the ability to do them. So I thought I would walk you through which ones are which, and I have them all. Yeah, so I'm going to try to hold these up in a way that you can see them and not drop them everywhere because they're invaluable. Okay, let's see how I can do this. It's not a super sturdy tray. Probably could have put another tray behind it to back it up, but anyway, there you go. And if you happen to be wondering about this tray, because I do get questions about that from time to time, I bought these from a now defunct retailer, so uh, I don't know where to get them anymore. I literally don't know where I'm going to get more when I need more. Uh, i got to figure that out. So. Uh, anyway, this is uh, the 2007 one. This is called Pearl White, um, and it's got uh, like a shiny kind of lacquer coating. It's not like that anodized look like some of them. There have been a couple of studios that have been this way. This one and then uh, Wild Rubin specifically. Uh, Royal Red. Wild Rubin, Royal Red. I can never remember which one's which. Hope I got them right. So anyway, Pearl White, that was 2007. But this next one here was called Pearl Black, even though it looks like a toffee brown. Uh, that's that color. It really looks a lot like the toffee all-star. Um, and then I have uh, pearl, uh, sorry, the purple, 
I think it was just called, no, Violet. That's what it was called. Violet. Some of these had gold nibs, some of them were steel. Um, and then what I have, Platinum Gray came next in 2009. Uh, there was a platinum plated, like a shiny platinum one that I don't have. That one was 2010. Um, I could have had it, but I didn't know how much I was going to end up being a Lamy collector at the time. Um, we started carrying the brand at the time that the Violet, Platinum Gray, and the Platinum Plated one were in, you know, kind of regular offering. I didn't really know how it worked back then, otherwise I totally would have kept one. So, uh, it's like one that's missing in my collection. Um, next came was Royal Red, um, which really ended up being kind of an orange. Um, and then Wild Ruben came next, which I honestly think looks more like a royal red because I that's, think that's why my brain gets them confused all the time. Anyway, so here's where you had the gap. So you had the platinum plated that was 2010, the royal red was 2012, and then Wild Reuben was 2014. And then it was 2017 before another one came, which was Racing Green. And we did not get many of those here in the U.S., just a handful. Next came Terracotta and Olive, these two. That's all of, that's terracotta. So um, that's what happened then. Uh, and then we still have some of those. I'm still waiting on a couple more aquamarine and Lux black. So those are still yet to come in 2019. So they were doing it every year. They kind of skipped a bunch of years and now they're like doubling up, kind of catching up. So um, that's kind of the history of the studio special editions there. Um, I have this other one here. This isn't a special edition, but this was um, a regular offering that is now since discontinued. So I thought I would at least mention it because it's blue. It's my favorite color. Um, so this was replaced by Imperial Blue. So this was just, I think it was called Royal Blue or just regular blue. I can't remember. I'm not so great with names, but anyway. So that's kind of a little history of the studios. There's other colors that are regularly offered now, like there's a black, there's a piano black, there's a stainless steel. Um, but these are the special editions or discontinued editions that are um, now a part of the Lamy history. And uh, hopefully now you have a little bit more appreciation and, and, you know, it would be one cool thing to see if they had any past special editions that they were willing to bring back. I don't know if they would do that with studios. They've done that with um, All Stars and um, Safaris before. Uh, I don't know if they've ever done that with a studio, quite honestly. So that would be kind of cool. Um, next question, Mike Larry on Instagram says, why is Visconti changing the nibs on the Homo sapiens? I will not belabor this because Drew and I did talk about this in right now, um, but it's very hot on my mind and it's kind of a big deal whenever a company changes a nib, especially a whole nib material like this. So I thought it was worth touching on at least a little bit here in Q&A, just in case you happen to not like watching a 10 minute video and you prefer watching an hour long video. And I'm shooting Q&A in the morning. I normally don't do that. So I'm drinking coffee now instead of water. You have to tell me if my energy is any different shooting this in the morning than it is shooting it in the afternoon. Usually I'm kind of dragging a little bit and I got to dig deep for Q&A. Gives me life though, so that's okay. Anyway, back to Visconti. Um, so it's not just on the Homo sapiens. You know, you're asking why are they changing the nibs on it? It's, it's all of the palladium nibs are changing over to 18 karat. We're just starting to see it first on the Homo sapiens. I think probably because the Homo sapiens is a more popular pen. So therefore the nibs that they had stocked on these pens are selling out first and they're needing to replace the 18 karat onto those palladium nib ones first. Um, specifically like the rose gold that's um, that's on the um, Homo sapiens bronze age and we're starting to see some dark age too. Um, I wanted to show you at least up close the difference between the two. Now this is not a super fair comparison because my palladium is actually about three and a half years old at this point and it is um, uh, two-tone which they had switched away from two-tone already earlier this year because of some plating um, complications they had in actually performing the two-tone. So basically when they do a two-tone nib, they have to, you can see here, the nibs basically look completely identical. I don't know how easy you can see, but the only real difference that you can tell is that there's an inscription at the bottom that says 18K instead of 23K. That's the way that you can tell if it's uh, a palladium versus a gold. The gold is the 18K, palladium is the 23K. Um, but anyway, when they do those two-tone nibs, they literally have to mask off all of the areas where they don't want the plating to be. Then they plate the nib, then they take the masking off. From what I understand, it's actually a very time consuming process um, and pretty laborious and requires some specialized skill. And from what I understand, you know, their nibs are made by Bach, but I've heard this at both Bach and Yovo, 
if you noticed, a lot of the Yovo nibs are going away from two-tone as well. I think there's just like, there's such demand for nibs right now. There's so few manufacturers who are making these nibs, and there's so few specialists who are doing the two-tone, you know, artwork basically on these nibs um, that they're having a hard time keeping up with demand. And so when you basically have a whole pen that's dependent upon a two-tone look or some, you know, specialized labor, I'm literally talking, there might be like one or two people at these nib companies that do this type of work. And if you have an entire pen model that is out of stock for long periods at a time because you can't get the two-tone work on the nib to be done, what are you gonna do as a pen company? You know, you can't offer your pen to people because you can't get that two-tone nib. So I think, um, you know, without having like super, super official, um, you know, reasons from Visconti about why they're doing the changeover, I have to look around at the industry, knowing what I know from all different brands and the different nib makers, seeing the trend of where things are going. You know, to me, fountain pens have been on the rise really kind of ever since we started this business. Um, uh, we've noticed that there's been more interest in fountain pens, uh, at least from us and so uh, from our customers. So uh, what I'm seeing though is, is longer lead times from manufacturers when, we, when they go to place an order for nibs. Um, when, when we are looking to, because we order nibs too, we are dealing with some of our own things like the Goulet nibs. They had to change over from two-tone to solid gold, solid you know gold plating again because of labor. So I think what you're seeing is um, you know there's such an increased demand of nibs from especially from the reputable companies, and then uh, you're getting into some nib shortages that are are putting some constraints on what products uh, pen companies are able to offer in terms of a nib front. So um, I, without having like super official. Um, you know, language or anything like that. This is just really my assumption and my perception of kind of putting some pieces together. I think probably a lot of the motivation for going back to the ATM Care Gold nibs from the Palladium nibs for Visconti probably had to do with stock. Just because looking at what we've seen as a retailer, there have been certain nib sizes, especially on things like the Bronze Age, um, Dark Age, where we've been out for long periods of time um, because of nib shortages, really. Uh, and, and so I think that probably this is an effort to, you know, get a more consistent product, a product that, um, you know, these 18 karat nibs, Bach is making 18 karat nibs all day long for all different kinds of companies that are using their nibs. And I think that uh, the Palladium nibs were something special they were doing just for Visconti. It's a different material, it's a different process. So probably what was happening is they were having a little bit harder time getting slotted in as the companies have been getting busier, the nib companies. And uh, it was just, it was creating a kind of a bottleneck. So they were trying to alleviate that bottleneck. You know, I heard maybe that there was a cost factor. I don't know how much cost was a factor in this. I know in right now there were some comments about like, well, are we gonna expect, you know, price decreases on the pens and stuff like that? I, I doubt it because we've seen price pressure to increase. It's rarely that things are decreasing. If anything, probably, and this is total speculation on my part, if anything, probably is to help curb a price, future price increase, not so much to try to drop the price down. And really, in the grand scheme of things, I don't think that there's probably a drastic, drastic difference in price between palladium and gold on like a per pen basis. It probably has more to do with availability. That's my perception. Plus, you know, the 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 palladium nibs have a very polarizing reputation. It's very interesting whenever I post, you know, especially after right now, um, getting some people's, um, you know, uh, feedback on that. You know, for a long time we've heard like, oh, the Visconti, anytime something would come out about a Visconti nib, you would hear people saying, you know, um, well, yeah, but are these nibs reliable or whatever? Because they had kind of reputation for a little bit there. They've largely fixed a lot of that. Honestly, I'm hearing less and less about any problems with palladium nibs because Visconti really looked to address that. Um, but, you know, even still, I think the 1800 karat nibs are gonna be very, very reliable. Even looking at the ones I have that we've gotten a few in, fine and medium on the Bronze Age Homo sapiens is what we're seeing so far. That's what this is. And uh, looking at them, writing with a few, looking at them under a loop, they look really good. And they feel really good, they flow well. So I think the, the move is going to be good. They had, the 18 karat nibs had a good reputation 
uh, before, about 10 years ago, before they switched over to the Palladium. And I think that uh, it's going to be end up being a really good call on Visconti's part uh, in the end in, the, in kind of the macro view. But I think largely had to do with practicality. And really, at the end of the day, I mean, you can mourn the Palladium. Um, it was kind of a differentiator. You know, they're going from the what they called the dream touch. Now I think they're calling it the perfect touch. Uh, really, I think it has to do with, um, you know, practicality on their part, like I've said. But I think from from your standpoint, if you're looking to get a Homo sapiens now, from what I've seen so far, you're not going to be getting a drastic different experience with the exception of the medium nib. The medium nib is way less of a gusher on the 18 karat as it was previous with the, with the Palladium. Uh, at least that's my perception of it so far. Um, but again, we just are getting them in. I'm just learning about them. I haven't seen all the nib sizes yet. I'll be able to do a more formal assessment once we get everything in and I can nib note and do the whole deal. Um, but it's at least something that's important enough that I thought was worthy of giving a heads up uh, since that's such a kind of an iconic pen for so many people. All right. Next question, Brad the Bear one on Instagram. What prevents brands from being able to make click retractable pens like the vanishing point. So click retractable pens, super common in the rollerball world and ballpoint world, not as common in fountain pens because it's a little more complicated. You have to, you know, be, have it refillable and you got to have the whole mechanism in there. It's a lot of engineering to make happen. The vanishing point really is kind of a marvel of a pen, honestly, in my opinion. I know some people aren't as crazy about it, but it's a super popular pen, very practical. Uh, very handy, and I'm a big fan of it. I have many of them. Uh, Rachel's a huge fan as well. She loves the way they write. Even though she's got the four-finger grip, she still loves it, and the clip doesn't bother her too much. The clip being on the end, that's really the only thing that kind of wigs some people out, but it's not as big of a deal as you would probably think for most people. Um, so the way that this thing works, I don't have like a full breakdown of it. I'm sure online you can find people that have completely disassembled it, but it's got this unit inside that's got this long skinny nib that's clearly a very custom proprietary nib from Pilot. And it's got, you know, the feed and mechanism inside here. And then it's got a removable converter or you can use a cartridge. Uh, and this whole unit is what is getting clicked inside this pen. And there's all kinds of springs and things and a little trap door in here that keeps it sealed up. So I think that's part of what is most complicated about this. You know, you really have to have some custom stuff designed. If you have a conventional size nib, you know, like say you have your Visconti Homo Sapiens, you have this huge nib. I mean, looking at the difference between this and the vanishing point, like there's no way you could have a nib the size of a normal nib be a click retractable and have it be a pen that is not like this big around, right? And I actually have some examples of some other pens that are retractable as well. But the vanishing point is the only click retractable that I have in my entire collection. And it's the only one that I'm really kind of aware that even exists. Um, with the exception of when I went to um, Japan with Platinum and they had their historical kind of thing set out for their 100th anniversary. They had pen designs from every year that they'd been in business, which was pretty cool. And uh, they had one from like the 60s, early 60s, I think it was, that was a prototype of a click retractable. It kind of looked similar to a vintage um, Namiki capless, as they were called before it became the pilot vanishing point. Um, and so that, I know that they're not the only company that is capable or has looked into doing it. I think having something that is economical and reliable is probably a huge barrier for a lot of other companies. Um, if you think about it, like the number of pens that you see getting knocked off and things like that, like why is pilot never had anyone really knock off? a vanishing point very effectively. I think it's because the engineering that's required is very tricky. And they've got a lot of proprietary parts and pieces and things like that they've developed um, and really kind of, you know, mastered in this pen. So I think to do it econom economically, to have that trap door and the click mechanism, I think is really tough. And the nib too would be a huge challenge. I think it's harder to achieve than most people realize. Um, and then just a couple other you know, retractables that I just wanted to feature a little bit. This is a pilot pen. This is called the Fermo. It uses the same vanishing point mechanism, except it's a twist mechanism instead of a click, uh, but it's the same thing. So it's kind of about the thickness of a decimo. 
uh, same nib unit inside, um, but it's got a twist. This isn't uh, available in the US anymore. It was not very popular. Um, we hardly sold any of these because it was considerably more expensive than a vanishing point, but just wanted to let you know that it does exist. Uh, Lamy has their own retractable that is the Dialog 3. Pretty cool feat of engineering. It doesn't seal as well as a vanishing point, but you can see there it's got a little trap door and boom, it comes out. And it's got a full size Lamy nib on it, which itself is a relatively, in the grand scheme of things, smaller nib than most other fountain pens have. Um, bigger than the vanishing point though, but still you got this, you know, a certain amount of girth that has to happen, especially at the end. And from what I understand, the engineering behind this pen is quite complicated as well. Um, so this pen is more in the $300 range anyway. And then uh, the one that I do have that is a retractable, that has a full size number six nib is the Stipula Da Vinci. Uh, this has a larger nib, but you see the girth of this pen and the, the diameter or the, uh, the length of it. It's pretty, it's pretty wild and it takes like a number of turns to get it open. So it's really not the most practical pen that you can get out there. Uh, just to show you the size difference between <laughs> the nibs on the Vanishing Point and the Da Vinci. Um, still a very, very cool pen. And because it has a larger body, they can do some cool things with designs. They've done a number of limited editions of these, and uh, I think they're still working on that. This is really kind of Stipula's flagship pen, if you will. Um, it's kind of cool. It's got a, a clip on here that's behind the grip, so you don't have to worry about that as much. Um, but when you twist it, I don't know how easily you can see that. When you twist it, it actually widens up the clip a little bit. So it's sort of adjustable based on the thickness of whatever shirt or pen case that you're clipping it onto. Pretty cool. Don't know how critical that is for most people, but it's a really cool piece of engineering. But that pen's more in like the $900 range. So it's really kind of not even in the same category so much as the Vanishing Point. But it is retractable, so I thought it was worth pointing out, but uh, yeah, I don't know. It would be cool to see other ones come out, but you know, I just, I don't think it's as quite as straightforward as something like, you know, the Pilot G2. And really, if anybody was able to do something, you would think it would be a company like Pilot because they do these, these click mechanisms all day long. But I think on a disposable pen like this, it's, you know, you can have more or less throwaway components. It's a little more difficult when you're working in metal and having fountain pen uh, parts and things like that, so. I don't know. If I'm not aware of something that's out there that is um, something like a vanishing point, please let me know because I'm very curious if there's other click retractables that maybe I'm just not not aware of yet. I don't know everything. All right, Pran Pranav on Instagram says, what are some high-end everyday carry fountain pens? No limited editions. Okay, high-end. Um, High-end everyday carry. So I kind of went with like basically what are the flagship pens for a bunch of different brands. And this is when I alluded at the beginning how I was going to be talking about a lot of different pens. Well, you've already seen I brought out a lot and now I've got more. A lot of them for the, were for this question. So high-end can mean a lot of different things. I definitely will tell people that like, oh yeah, I sell fountain pens. And people are like, oh, how much does a pen cost? I'm like, well, you know, on the low end, it might be, you know, 10 or $15. And people are like, $15? Who in the world would pay $15 for a single pen? Blah, 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 blah. And I'm like, oh, okay, that's like on the low end. You would ima you cannot imagine. And I don't even bother telling them about like some of the crazy ones. Unless I just really want to, you know, blow the blow their minds. Um, but a lot of times people, you know, for the average person, they're like, you know, $50 for a pen? How would that's insane? Not understanding that like this is a pen that can last, last you the rest of your life. Uh, but for some people, it's just not a priority for them, and that's totally fine. These are the same people that would like spend equally as much money, if not more, on something that is within their own interest that we would think is crazy. So it's just, you know, people fall in different categories and think different things are crazy. So anyway, all that to say that high-end can mean a lot of different things. It could mean $25 to some people. It could mean, you know, some people don't think that high-end is anything below $1,000, you know? Uh, it all just is a matter of perspective, right? So I'm gonna just gonna kind of do a broad stroke here. Pretty much anything high-end has to have a gold nib or something equivalent. So that's where I would really kind of start considering anything to be high-end. Um, so I'll start a little bit on the lower end and kind of work my way up, if you will. Um, when you get into really like high-end stuff, a lot of the, when you start to get into the more stratospheric levels, that's when you start to get into limited editions and stuff like that. So a lot of the more base level, kind of everyday carry type flagship pens uh, are not gonna be, 
you know, maybe so stratospheric. These are something that, that are mildly attainable for um, the average pen enthusiasts if you are focused and dedicated towards it. Now, of course, not for everybody. We are, we are fully into a discretionary product category here, so um, all disclaimers there, but I'll kind of start, start at one place and kind of work my way up. Um, first one that I have is a Lamy 2000, which I'm realizing I didn't even pull a dang Lamy 2000 out of my collection. I think, oh, here it is. Keep it on my desk. Uh, but anyway, so Lamy 2000, classic pen. It's been around for over 50 years. It's great, gold nib, piston filler, writes awesome. Uh, so I'm a big fan of that one. I'll put that in there. It's really more, it's very much of an everyday pen, um, but you're in that like $160 range. Um, great pen. If you wanted to stick with Lamy, go maybe a little bit higher end. Uh, I would say the Dialogue 3. Uh, I don't like the way that this one seals as much as for an everyday carry, but I do know people that everyday carry it and love it. Um, and if you are using it and writing with it every day and you're keeping ink flowing through that pen, uh, it, it works pretty well. It doesn't sit for long periods of time really well as much as the Lamy 2000 does. So it really depends on how much you're using it, but the Dialogue 3 is going to run you more $300. Uh, the Pilot Vanishing Point, of course, there's all different versions of it. Um, if you really wanted to have a a high-end version of a Vanishing Point, because both the Lamy 2000 and the Vanishing Point are considered more at the like entry, excuse me, entry level gold nib price in that 150, 160 range, 70, 170 range. Um, yeah, the, it's 176 now for the the Lamy 2000. Sorry, my 160 was like for years, but the price went up recently a little bit. Um, the Vanishing Point has editions of it that are in that lower range, in the 150-ish range. This one is a little bit more. You get more into the $600 range when you get into the Rodden versions of it, okay? Um, so, But they're not numbered. They're not limited editions. You can get the Rodden ones that are definitely high-end that uh, are regularly available, and they're great everyday pens, so it's a worthy mention. Uh, another one is a Pilot Custom 823. Uh, this one is going to be around $300. And uh, solid everyday carry. They have it both amber and black now in the U.S. Uh, smoke, as they call it. Uh, great everyday carry pen. Um, nothing limited edition about it, but very solid. Good nib. What else we got here? The Diplomat Aero has a gold nib, which is going to run you in the 350-ish range. A lot of them they have steel nibs and then a gold nib option uh, as an upgrade, but this is definitely um, the most popular pen for us with Diplomat um, in this price range and uh, very solid pen. Great performing Yovo nibs. They're, they write really well. So good everyday carry there. Uh, Peniner has one, the La Grande Belleza. This is their flagship pen. Really solid nib made by Bach. They're designed as the quill nib, as they like to call it, with a 14 karat gold. Um, very springy, nice flow. Um, that twist magnetic, which is really kind of cool. Um, I mean, of course, you can just pull it apart. It's magnetic, but it has like a reverse polarity magnet in the, in the uh, grip that will kind of naturally push it apart when you twist the pen. Super cool, Dante Del Vecchio coming up with some interesting stuff. So um, that pen's around the $400 range. Um, if we move over to Italy, we have Aurora as their 88. Of course, they have the Optima as well, but the 88 uh, I think probably is more of their, you know, kind of flagship pen. Um, gold nib, piston fill, ink window, lots of good stuff going on with this pen. Um, very solid writer as well. Um, some of their pens, they have both 14 karat and 18 karat versions. So the 18 karat gets a little more in the high end, but they tend to do that more on the limited edition pens. But they do have some regularly available um, uh, 88s that you can check out. Uh, let's go to Germany. We got Pelican. So Pelican, depending on what you consider to be their high end, really the M600, 800, and 1000 are all kind of that high end range. The 1000 being the flagship. The 800, I think, is where I would consider most to be like the, yeah, this is definitely solidly in that high end range. Uh, and then the 1000 for sure. Um, this is the Ocean Swirl, one of my favorite pens. Um, love that. Uh, so that's a really good one. Uh, and you're looking in like the, you know, 450 ish on up price coming from the 600 and going on up to the eight or 900s for the M1000. And then we have, uh, sticking with Germany. Uh, we have Mont Blanc, so this is not a brand that I sell, but I would be remiss not to mention this as a 
um, everyday carry kind of um, expensive pen. Uh, so there's the one, Mont Blanc 146 and 149, very similarly themed. It's just one's a little bit thinner, one's a little bit thicker. Um, the 149 really is the is the flagship. So huge nib on it, nice writer, good pen. You are paying a premium for it. You're pushing $1,000 with that pen, um, but it's kind of competing with that Pelican M1000 and all that. Um, and then kind of in that vein too, you get into um, Sailor, which they have their 1911, which is more comparable to the uh, Mont Blanc 146. And then you get into the King of Pens, which is closer to that Mont Blanc 149, just to give you some comparison here. Now I don't sell Sailor either, but I do have the pens and I am aware of them. Now the King of Pens is a little bigger and this is actually technically, this is a King of Pens uh, that is from Classic Pens. So it's not necessarily a Sailor, legit, totally Sailor, whatever. It uses Sailor parts and all that, but it has been uh, aftermarket, if you will. Um, so that's the King of Pens there. And then this is a 146 compared to a 1911L. They have an S version, a smaller version as well, um, but pretty comparable there. And you're looking, you know, for a, a King of Pens, you're looking in that $1,000 range. And then the, the 1911L, I think you're in like the four to $500 range, somewhere around there. Uh, but again, I'm not super, super up to date on those since I don't carry them. Uh, another one from Platinum is the President, which actually we don't carry, but we have been looking into it. Um, if you're interested, please shout out. The 3776 is the one they tend to come out with more limited editions and things like that. The President is just kind of like, boom, it's here, it's in a couple colors. Nothing too crazy, but it's got kind of an Art Deco feel. It's slightly bigger than the 3776. Um, and it's kind of there, it's kind of a staple for them. So that one is in like the 300 to 350 range, I think. Uh, Visconti, of course, I have to mention that with the Homo sapiens being by far, you know, the Bronze Age especially, but the Dark Age too. Um, they are regularly offered pens and they um, are most certainly most people's kind of grail everyday carry pens. Uh, and then also there's the Opera Master, which the Opera Master you know, it's, it's more of an honorable mention because they usually are only available as limited editions. They really don't have a regularly offered one. Um, so actually it really shouldn't be on the list at all. But I thought I would at least mention it. This is one that we did the, um, the um, Luna, uh, which we're almost out of, almost out of. We had it for about a year and a half and we literally have like a single handful left. So if you were looking at a Luna, get on it like right now because they're gonna be gone uh, probably in the next couple weeks. Anyway, um, so the Opera Master, I don't know if they've ever had it regularly offered. So now that I'm looking at this list again, I really shouldn't have it on here. Um, the Pilot Custom Yurushi uh, is a regularly offered one. I don't have one here to show you, but uh, very cool pen from Pilot's in like the $1,000 price range. Um, but it's Yurushi coated, so it's it's lacquered, it's, it's hand done, so it's a lot of work to do that. Nothing like Machier artwork kind of stuff on it, but it's Yurushi lacquered. Uh, and then uh, going up to Namiki, why not? Uh, we have the Yukari, the larger version Yukari you were on in the Emperor. They really kind of fall more into a limited edition kind of range, but they do have some, especially in the Yukari, that are, are more regularly offered that aren't, um, you know, limited edition per se. This is the only one that I have on me, which is, uh, um, I don't think it's actually like a numbered limited edition. I, I can't remember the Yukari. Um, Nightline Moonlight. So anyway, that's a cool, cool pen. Everyday writer. I mean, they make them to be everyday writers. Namikis are awesome writers. So nice little diversity of pens there for you that not all the versions that I showed you here um, are regularly offered colors or versions of them because I tend to collect more of the limited ones in my own collection. Um, but everything I showed you here, with the exception of probably the Opera Master, is something that there's a variation of it that you can get as a regularly offered pen. Cool. All right, ink. Uh, I have one ink questions. This is from Nina Blue on Instagram. I know I want to know the best qualities that a good ink should have. Oh my. Okay, so this is probably one of the most subjective questions that you could ask. Um, it 100% depends on what you consider a good ink to be and what you consider the best qualities of said good ink to be. Uh, it's really going to vary all over the place. I think there's definitely some, you know, kind of common things about ink that people find 
undesirable, <laughs> you know, like, does it smell really weird? Does it uh, clog up your pen? Uh, does it stain your pen or your fingers? Or does it stain things that it touches? Um, you know, is it bleed through the paper? Does it uh, feather really bad? You know, I think they're, um, is the dry time really, really obscenely long? You know, these are all undesirable qualities that I think most people would consider not to be good. Um, but pretty much depending on what qualities you are looking for in your ink, you may have to compromise on some of these other qualities uh, given what it is you're trying to achieve. When it comes to ink, there are certain laws of chemistry and physics that just cannot be broken. And, uh, you know, at least not with modern technology. And sometimes people's expectations can get a little unrealistic in terms of what an ink should or shouldn't be able to do. And there are some things that um, just have to be able to um, be compromised on. So, um, you know, I think in general, people want easy operation of the pen, easy to kind of clean out. That is desirable quality. The challenging thing about some of these things that I'm talking about here is there's no real way to look at an ink or be told about how it, you know, how it's marketed or how it's um, labeled or anything like that and be able to know exactly all the qualities that you want. This is part of what makes our community such an enrich <laughs> enriching environment is because, you know, depending on the type of ink, the paper, the pen that's being used, the writer, the preferences, the different scenarios it's under, there can be so many different variables at play with any given ink uh, that it's really impossible to have like a single thorough review that shows all the different scenarios an ink could possibly be useful for um, and then have you make like the perfect decision. This is why we offer ink samples, right? We have swabs of all the colors, we have the names, we have as many properties as we can muster, and then we have ink samples so that you can just try it in your pen because that's honestly the best bet. Uh, but we do have, you know, some factors of product reviews. We have, you know, reviews on our site so that people can speak about their experiences of them because again, it is so subjective. Um, it is just very difficult to convey all of the different qualities, especially what might be considered good. Um, so I think the depth of color is a factor, the level of saturation, you know, what type of flow, they can all be dependent on what you're looking for. Most people in general, especially in the US, are wanting a more deeply saturated color, not always, but that tends to be more popular. Um, smooth flow, smooth, you know, on the wet side, um, more shading, more sheen, um, that can vary a lot, but these tend to be some of the more popular colors. Um, whether or not you want water resistance or any degree of permanence, that is a very polarizing factor as well. For some people, they're diehard, like I will never use an ink unless it's a permanent like waterproof ink because that is important to me. Other people are like, why do they even bother making permanent inks? How could you possibly desire that? So it's super polarizing even within the pen community. And I think, you know, I fall more in the middle. I think there's a good time to have permanence and I think there's a time where that doesn't really matter at all. You know, if all else was equal, like why wouldn't you have permanence, you know? But uh, there's some things about permanence that it affects the way that the ink performs, especially with certain color, uh, certain dye groups. Um, you know, whereas like you're not gonna see the same degree of shading, you're not gonna see the same degree of dry time and things like that if you have permanence as part of it. Um, and that can, that can vary a lot, depending on the brand, depending on the color and all these types of things. So it's, it's not so easy to, to just lump everything to a certain group or a certain category and say, if you have this quality that you want, you can expect this outcome. It's really on a case by case basis, pretty much. Um, I think generally people are looking for shorter dry time. That's usually a pretty good thing. I think if there's a longer dry time, people are never like, yay. It's more just like, oh, okay, I'll put up with that in order to get the sheen or in order to get the permanence that I want, I will tolerate a longer dry time. Or other people are like, nope, I'm left-handed. I smear over everything I write. I have to have short dry time. Therefore, I will limit my ink selection to whatever has the shortest dry time and pick something from there. You know, so there you go. So um, one interesting thing um, that gets talked about here and there in the community, I'm still very cloudy on how big of a deal it really is, um, is pH level of ink. Um, I think generally speaking, pH neutrality is desirable because you're gonna have less um, you know, impact of ink or, or paper or pen you know, that, that's gonna happen, but it's really amazing. Actually, Rachel just slacked me a, 
um, a thread on Fountain Pen Network today, actually, that, uh, that has somebody that tested the pH level of all these different inks, and it's super helpful. And it's really interesting to see, even within one brand, how much the pH level can vary tremendously from one color to another. Um, you know, some inks can be like a pH of like two and a half in one color and another one is eight. It's just amazing to see what the difference is. And it's not advertised on most fountain pen inks. And some of them that are regarded as like, oh, these are the, the safest, most staple inks from certain brands. You're like, yeah, it's got a pH of like four. You know what I mean? So it's like fairly acidic, you know? So it's like pretty, pretty interesting to see, um, you know, and there's great debate about how important pH level really is in the pen world. And I'm not a chemist. I did terrible in chemistry. I didn't do terrible. I got like a C minus in chemistry. No, maybe I, maybe I got a B minus in chemistry. I struggled uh, and worked really hard to get a very, a very moderate grade in chemistry. Um, and maybe I got a C. I can't, really can't remember, but I didn't do great. Let's put it that way. Um, so it's really not my expertise, but I think that uh, it's, it's, it's something that really could be better understood. But it's important for some people in some brands like Noodlers on their, their, their conventional ink line will say pH neutral. Um, so we'll try to advertise when we can, but it's just, it's not something that is widely known about. Um, so the bottom line is it's, it's just, you know, aside from, you know, the obvious of like having an ink work properly in your pen and not destroy things and be a huge mess. It's really gonna depend on what is the goal that you want that ink to achieve of whether it will be good and be the best for what you need. And it has to really be taken on a case by case basis. And there's nothing like getting a sample in your hand and testing it out um, after you've read some reviews and, and seen what other people have done um, to get that experience. All right, and the last question for this week, this is a business question from Glenn M on Facebook. Has Goulet won any awards for your business practices and customer service? How much of how you do things as an extension of you two as people, I'm assuming me and Rachel, uh, would you say, and how much of it comes out of business school <laughs> as a deliberate strategy? Yeah. Uh, regardless, almost every online business I've ever dealt with could learn a thing or two from you. Well, I appreciate that, Glenn. Thank you very much. Um, okay, so the first thing, I'll talk about the awards part of it. Um, we've gotten a couple of different awards, yes, when we've applied for them. So, you know, with rare exception, I think, um, you have to apply for any given award that you're looking for. I don't know that in the business world, generally speaking, people are just randomly handing out awards. Um, it's generally because there's some kind of trade organization that you're looking to be affiliated with, or there's some kind of, you know, um, recognition you're seeking to be known as a leader in whatever area it is that you're trying to focus on, whether it's, you know, um, something related to project management or ISO 9001 or whatever it is, you have to basically kind of seek it out. Um, so there are some companies that, strategically really look to seek out a lot of awards and recognition. I think especially if you're in like, you know, the marketing agency world, there's a lot of different awards. Awards mean prestige. Prestige means you win more clients. It means you attract better talent. Therefore, pursuing awards is very common in certain industries because it means you get that notoriety and that can make you, you know, achieve your goals a little easier. For us, it's a little different. We're very insular. We're in the pen world. Our reputation with you all as customers really is the most important thing. So we are kind of earning whatever recognition that we get on a interaction by interaction basis, right? So it's like one-on-one, -on -one, really pretty regularly. We put out content. We do types of things to help our reputation. Um, but that largely is not going to be greatly influenced by you know, third party kind of recognition of awards. So we really didn't pursue that at all for the first eight years we were in business um, because we are trying to make sure that we have a solid foundation. We're actually running a good business. Um, we started to pursue that a little bit around our company culture because we really are intentional about that. We think we have a really special team and we got a good thing going. 
you know, when we have a strong culture like that, that really helps to um, stem out and, and then customer service is better. When our team is happier and we have a really thriving culture, you know, we have better processes in place. We have better recruiting and better things when we have a really strong culture. So um, it was most important for us to focus on that internally first. Um, and now we are pursuing very strategically some select awards um, really kind of around culture um, for two reasons. You know, and for us, some of it was we're a very small business in a city. You know, we are trying to recruit really good people into our culture. Fit is extremely important, but it's really helpful for people who don't, you know, we're a small company in, in a, you know, a medium-sized city. Uh, so recruiting is, you know, something that like not everybody in our own city even knows who we are. You know, it's like if you go up to the average person and say, I'm really into fountain pens, they're like, what pens? What are you talking about? The thing with the feather? Is that a fountain pen? Like most people don't know even what it is, let alone the fact that we do this as a business. So there's like an intrigue when people learn about it, but it's not like an inherently known thing. It's not like we're in real estate or we're in something where it's like, you know, a really known quantity. We're in the construction business or something. Um, that's pretty defined. Uh, for us, online fountain pen retailer, not something that everybody knows about. So um, for us, it's helpful to have from a recruiting and kind of like, stand, you know, local standpoint in our city, it's helpful for us to have at least some kind of marker um, of, you know, what generally can you assume we are like as a company? And uh, so we have a, a local award that was uh, called Top Workplaces uh, in our city of Richmond, and we got listed as the number three top workplace in Richmond uh, last year, which is pretty cool. Um, so uh, that was nice, and uh, you know, to get some of that local kind of connections and recognitions and stuff like that. Um, and it definitely helps when we're like posting for a position and we're trying to recruit people from outside of our company to work uh, and join our team, you know, having that as kind of like a little badge, people can make an assumption that, okay, culture is something that we focus on here. Of course, they have to come in and see what it's like and be a good fit and all that, but at least that is something that helps us stand out a little bit from maybe the myriad of other small companies doing obscure things they've never heard of um, that can help. Um, but really the most important part of the local recognition that we have there is that um, part of that process of doing the top workplaces or a great place to work or any of these types of things is that there's an internal survey that happens as a result and you can get these results and you can learn where the weak areas are within your own company culture. And we talk about it on a regular basis and stuff like that, but there's just something different when we intentionally sit everybody down and we do these surveys, it just, we, different information comes out than it does in one-on-one -on -one meetings and strategic planning sessions. Um, so it just gives us um, kind of a mirror in a blind spot that we might have as a company. And then we can improve on those sorts of things. And when we, you know, show that we're investing in working on our company and then improving on those things, morale is really good because people really feel heard and all that kind of stuff. And it's all anonymous and all that. So maybe the anonymity is a part of it where people who may be hesitant to speak up about certain things are more willing to do so in an anonymous survey. Um, yeah, that can be a factor for sure. Um, so we did that. We got number three small business Richmond. We didn't apply this year because you know, we have other awards that we're trying to do. We don't want to just like become award collectors. Um, I know a lot of other smaller businesses who will will accumulate a lot of awards um, and pursue that almost as kind of a strategy. That's particularly helpful, I guess, uh, when you are looking to um, get outside investments. So like if we were looking to pursue venture capital and we really wanted to have notoriety and these types of things to get help in funding really um, or if we were doing like massive recruiting like and we were really trying to grow and scale a huge business that's where like a lot of awards and stuff are really helpful because then you get more PR you get more of that kind of stuff and it just helps to fuel this machine that you're kind of a building um, we're a little like we're pacing ourselves a little bit. We're not trying to go into some huge, I mean, by all means, we have you know 40 people in our company. That's pretty big, in my opinion. In the grand scheme of things, though, it's not that big. Like, we, we applied this year for a great place to work, um, which is like a Forbes, or the, the Great Place to Work Institute. So it's like, there's all these different versions of different you know awards, um, but that's the one that we applied for this year. So we took off a break 
from the top workplaces for our city locally this year so that we could just do, we don't want to like have survey fatigue and be serving our team every month for all these different awards and stuff that gets to be draining. Um, so we wanted to pace ourselves a little bit. So we did the, the great place to work and we got, we're certified as a great place to work, woo! Um, and so that's pretty cool. It's based on, an, you know, a third party company does internal survey, it's all anonymous. They take the results and they certify us and that's cool. And it's all compared to other companies that apply into the same kind of deal. Um, so that's kind of cool. Uh, so we're in, a, we're in a club there. Um, but uh, what was I gonna say about that one? There's other awards that we may get a result as a result of doing that, that survey, but we haven't uh, heard about those yet throughout the rest of 2019. Um, and then I was going to say something else about it. I think I just lost it. Um, great place to work. Oh, dang, I completely lost my train of thought. Oh, well, maybe it'll come back to me. Um, another thing that was cool about last year when we got the, um, the top workplaces in our local city in Richmond. This, oh, I remember. Okay. I got my thought. I'm going to take my thought, put it right there. It has to do with the size of companies. Okay, so the um, top workplace thing. So we got the, the, the number three one, that's fine. Um, but we also got a special kind of, what do they call it? A, you know, just a separate award. Oh gosh, I don't watch award shows very much, so I don't really know what they're called. Superlative, that's what it is. A superlative. Um, we got the doer award. So basically within our own company, we got rated as like doing the most stuff. <laughs> being the most productive um, out of all of the size companies in our city. And we have like CarMax and Capital One and these other, like Altria, we have all these other huge companies that are really production oriented. And we got the doer award as like the little Gilly Pen Company. So we're like, yeah, we're doers. Uh, Cause we do do a lot of things. Anyway, uh, so the size of the company, yeah. And it varies a lot. Like we did the Great Place to Work Institute version of the Great Place to Work um, thing. Anything under a thousand employees is considered a small business. So here we are with like our 40. I think you have to have 30 or 35 to even be able to apply for this award. So we're like just eking it in there of being big enough to even apply. Uh, and small business is considered under a thousand. And then I think a medium business is like 10 to 50,000 and then large is like 50,000 or more or something. I don't know, I didn't research it that much because we're so far away from that and it's never gonna happen. But um, I did think that was interesting. Um, so, um, the award itself, you know, doesn't really change who we are. We're not really pursuing it a lot. We really just wanted it to be more of a validation reflection for our own team, for ourselves and for other candidates, um, to see the kind of business that we are trying to be. Um, and then I got to go back to <laughs> the second question you had here about how much of it comes from us as opposed to business school. Um, business school does not teach you how to run a great company. Uh, just straight up. Uh, I didn't, you know, technically I graduated with a real estate uh, degree in a liberal arts portion of Virginia Tech, uh, the university there. So technically, if you want to get super technical, I didn't graduate from the business school, the Pamplin Business School. Rachel did though. Um, I was in it for a year and a half and then I changed my major and it was in a different program. Still took a lot of the same business classes and stuff, but whatever. Um, still, during my tenure of a year and a half there, not once, not once was anything about company culture, entrepreneurship, running a business, not once was that even approached, let alone focused on or influenced anything. Um, you know, basically, if you go to a large college for business school, they teach you how to operate as a manager within a larger organization. I understand there are some incubators and some things like that that they are trying to put into colleges to help entrepreneurs to start up businesses. I would give a heavy, heavy like side stare to any of these programs until I understand them very thoroughly because really how is an academic institution in a large governmental bureaucratic organization going to understand anything about what it is to start a business unless, unless they have just free reign control given to adjunct professors who are actively running their own businesses while they're teaching these classes. That's like the only caveat I could say where, okay, there might be a chance that you could learn some entrepreneurial things in this type of environment, but largely it's the kind of thing like you can take, I, I equate it having a business like having a kid. 
you know, nothing against anybody who doesn't have kids. But, like, it's just one of these things that, like, or if you have, like, you know, a, a serious disease or you have some, like, major life-changing event, um, you can equate it to a lot of different things. Um, it's just one of those things that you can read about it, you can be taught about it, you can talk about it, you can do everything in the world, you can hang out with people who are doing it, but until you go through it yourself, you just really don't know what you're getting into or how you're going to manage it. Um, so for Rachel and I, it was baptism by fire. Once we started this business, some business school things helped, like basic understanding of finance and, and some of these other like HR labor laws, really just understanding like, oh, there's something HR related I probably need to research here. Let me go on whatever .gov site I need to and actually learn the details of what's going on. So some of that may have been like sparked based on what we may have learned in school. But company culture and great place to work, like all that stuff, like none of that was ever approached or discussed in business school. At least when we went 12, 13 years ago or whatever. I'm sure there are some business schools who are much better about that. I'm hoping that there are. Um, but largely I would say there's a great use for business school, but it is not to start your own company as we have. Now, there's a lot of other companies you can start up and it's great. I'm not trying to knock school too hard, um, but believe me, just because you go to business school doesn't mean you're gonna run uh, a great place to work. You, you gotta have that come from within as the founder. Um, no skill or thing that you've been taught is going to carry you through enough of everything you need to do. You gotta muster it and it just has to be a part of who you are and you gotta inject that DNA into your company when you start that up. It's just how it has to be. Now that Rachel and I are companies growing and all that, we still gotta keep our soul in the business. We have 40 people now, it's not just her and I. So we've injected that into our mission statement, our purpose, our company values. We hire to that, we manage to that, we lead, we speak on it all the time. We make decisions bumping up against the guardrails that we put in place in our own mission and values. Um, so that is what largely helps to guide us now. And Rachel and I more just kind of embody you know, and live out what those things are. And people see that as an example within our own company. And we may do things that are kind of outside those guardrails too. It's we need those in place. You need boundaries. That's why you have a budget, right? Like you may be tempted to go outside your budget, but you're like, nope, the budget's here for a reason. Keeping the budget, okay, cool. We're still going to achieve our goals. So we don't do everything great here. This is not trying to be like a brag fest kind of thing, even though it may come across that way. Um, we fail every single day. I think I've failed three or four times today already by the time I've shot this. Um, but dang it, do we try. And all we can really do is do the best with what we have. Um, and that's all that we can ask of ourselves and our team. And if you do that, wherever you're at, whatever your skills, whatever your um, level of training and schooling and all that kind of stuff, if you do your best and you care deeply, then you're gonna be better off than you would have otherwise. And that's all anybody can ask. All right, my question of the week for this week is writing related. What's the longest that you've ever sat down and written in one session? Longest you ever sat down and written. Maybe you had like a three hour lecture or something, you were writing furiously the whole time. Um, but uh, yeah, longest you've ever sit down and written in one time. Mine's not too epically long, probably maybe 30 minutes or so in like a long journaling session or something like that. I do have times where I sit and think and I'm writing as a part of it, but I'm talking like you're sitting and writing the whole time. Um, maybe 30 minutes to it, eh, maybe an hour, maybe I was practicing handwriting or something for an hour or so, but again, like young kids, business, all that kind of stuff, I'm not sitting down for hours at a time. But I'm curious to hear how you do it. Uh, and then my writing prompt for you, um, this is for you to just be inspired to actually pick up your pen. Going back to Garth with napkin notes, um, write a loving phrase on a napkin and give it to a friend or a family member in your life. Um, I was inspired by Garth and I wrote napkin notes to my kids the last couple of days and uh, I'm gonna see their reactions and see what they think of it. Um, I'm hoping that they, that they notice or care, but time will tell. Anyway, so just go ahead and do that. It's kind of fun. Write a note on a napkin for somebody and just leave it for them to find. All right, that's it for this week. Talked about a lot of pens. You can check them all out on gulaypens.com. Be sure to like, comment, and subscribe. Thank you so much for watching and right on. Thank you.